establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and live in peace. Amen. Welcome. Thank well, you. Well, let's walk. Stacy, as you can read in, in, in your bulletin, is a working nurse. She's working today. She asked for a half an hour off so she could come. So that's that's her commitment. She, she, she was able to get here. And so Stacy, when you leave, we understand. So thank you for coming in. Stacy is involved on a weekly basis as one of the leaders of the youth group here on Wednesday nights and, and she's doing a, a tremendous job and we're just pleased to have you in there and now as a member of the church. Thank you so much. Thank you so much everyone.
to do a review today. You know what a review is? Anybody know what a review is? Do you ever do a review in school? And, and, and what, does that, what does that mean? You learn the stuff that you already know. Well, you, you don't read, yeah, you may, you may relearn it. That's right. But it, it, you, it's put before you again and you remember better. And, and that's the way you learn, how to, that's the way our muscles learn how to do things, actually. Uh, is that it, they have, we have a memory. And we just continue to help that memory in our brain is a muscle. So the more we review, the better it learns, right? Absolutely. So today I want to review Easter. And I want to review where we are today. So what happened, what happened on Good Friday? Remember anybody remember what happens on Good Friday? It was when Jesus was crucified, when he was killed. Yep. And then they put, him in a, they put him in a tomb. And on Easter morning, three days later, what happened? He was. He came alive. He came alive. How could a dead man come alive? Doesn't make any sense, does it? How did that happen? Because of God, because Jesus is who? God. Jesus is God. God can do anything. Exactly right. So he arose, and we now worship Jesus, who is a living Savior. And he sent the Holy Spirit to us. And the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and tells us what is right, what's wrong, so that we don't do the wrong things and we only do the right things. Today, all of your parents and everybody's going to hear a story about two of his disciples who were walking along the road from Jerusalem to a place called Emmaus. It's a town that's seven miles away from Jerusalem. Okay? And they were walking and they were talking and they were really, really sad because they didn't understand really what had happened. Jesus was killed, and then he was alive, and they thought that he had failed in everything that he had done. Okay? And all, and all of a sudden, as they were walking alongside him, came a third person and started to walk with them. Okay? That third person they didn't recognize. Who do you suppose that was? Who do you think? Jesus. It was Jesus. And, and it says that their eyes were heads were uh, shielded so they couldn't figure out who it was. And he walked with them and talked with them and, and he, they told him what, what had happened and how sad they were. And then they got to their home in the town of Emmaus. And when they were having dinner, because they invited this, this, this third person that they didn't know who it was, they were having dinner. Jesus broke the bread just like we do in communion. And all of a sudden they realized what it was. It was the living sin. And their eyes were open. And they went back. And they told all of the others about what they had seen. And that's called what we call witnessing. They witnessed to what they had seen. So the, the other disciples knew without question that the, that the risen Jesus that Jesus had risen and he was with them. And he appeared to a lot of people. But it was important that he appeared to those two disciples so they could go back and witness. So that's the review. And a little bit of extra too. Jesus died, he arose, he appeared to many. And we now have to witness to our friends about who Jesus is and of what Jesus means to us in our hearts. I think we can do that. And you listen to your Sunday school teachers, and they'll teach you how to do that. Okay? I'll stand up in a prayer.
Help us to be good girls and boys. Help us to listen to what you tell us to do through your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, today you're going with Miss Kim. There she is. All her.
For the Lord has no part to be with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consecration, all of you. us 
They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then, then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see standing for our hymn. The king would select the winner. The first person 
presented was a wealthy philanthropist. The king was told that this man was highly deserving of the honor because of his humanitarian efforts. He was given much, he had given much of his wealth to the poor. The second person was a celebrated physician. The king was told that, his, that this doctor was highly deserving of the honor because he had rendered faithful and dedicated service to the sick for many, many years. The third person was a distinguished judge. The king was told that the judge was worthy because of his noted wisdom, his fairness, and his brilliant decisions. The fourth person presented was an elderly woman. Everyone was, was quite surprised to see her there because her manner and was quite humble as was, as was her dress. She hardly looked a part of, of someone who, who would be honored as the greatest subject in the kingdom. What chance could she possibly have when compared to the other three? Who, those who had, had accomplished so much? Even so, there was something said about her. There was something about her. The look of Love in her face, the understanding in her eyes, her quiet confidence. The king was intrigued, to say the least, and, and, and somewhat puzzled by her presence. He asked who she was. The answer came, you see, the philanthropist, the doctor, and the judge? Well, she was their teacher. This woman had no wealth, no fortune, and no title. But she was, she had unselfish, uh, unselfishly given her life to produce great people. She had given sacrificially for the love of others. There is nothing more powerful or more Christ-like than sacrificial love. The king, the king couldn't see the value of the of, the, of that humble lady. He totally missed the significance of the teacher. I think often we miss the value of those around us. I think it would be, it would surprise us to know how often we miss the presence of Christ, just as Cleopas and, the, and his brother miss the significance of the stranger on the road to Emmaus. It is likewise easy for us to miss the significance of the resurrection. The road to Emmaus gives us lessons on in how we miss the reality that we have a living and a loving Lord that keeps us learning every day of our lives. So on the road to Emmaus, number one, don't miss the significance of the resurrection. It transforms us. Look closely at, at what happened to, to these two brothers as they journeyed from Jerusalem to their home in the city of Emmaus, seven miles away. A stranger, who we know, whom we know as Jesus, joins them. He asked, he asked them what they're talking about, and they stopped dead in their tracks. They can hardly bring themselves to discuss it because they are so saddened by the events of the previous three days. Their friend, their, their master, their rabbi, the, the one they described as the mighty prophet, had been unjustly condemned to death and violently killed on a cross. They say to their new traveling companion, Are you the only person in all of Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place? Then they go on to tell the Res the resurrected Jesus who's walking with them, what has happened? Listen to what happens next. This is the part that intrigues me. Jesus begins to interpret the Old Testament and explains to them how all these things were spoken of by Moses and by the prophets. He opens the scriptures to them. He transforms their thinking. They had no idea that these things were supposed to take place. 
It had concluded that Jesus' mission had absolutely failed. They now understood that the last three days of God's plan had to happen. There was no plan B. Can you even begin to imagine having Jesus open the scriptures, scriptures while sitting before you and then interpret them? I can't. I can't. I hope that in heaven that Jesus will do that continually. But to, to, to experience it here on earth is beyond my human ability to imagine. And I've got a good imagination. Finally, the two brothers invite Jesus into their home. He has dinner with them. Again, Jesus transformed that event. There, at that ordinary dinner, at the end of the day, this stranger takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, gives it to them, and their eyes are opened. In that moment, they are transformed. There's, there's a story about a young boy named Walter Elias. He was born in the city. His parents one day moved into the country to become farmers. Walter had a vivid imagination. And the farm was a perfect place for this, this young boy with a wandering mind. One day, in the apple orchard, he was amazed when he saw sitting on the branch of one of the apple trees an owl. An owl. He just stood there and stared at the owl. He thought about what his father had told him about owls. Owls always rested during the day because they hunted throughout the night. Owl was asleep. Walter also thought that the owl might make a great pet. Being careful not to make any noises, he stepped over sticks and over leaves. The owl was in deep sleep because it never heard Walter Elias walking toward it. Finally, standing under the owl, he reached up and he grabbed the legs of the owl. Now the events that followed are difficult to explain and they're also difficult to hear. Suddenly everything was out of chaos as you can imagine. The bird, the owl came to life. <coughs> to life. Walter's thoughts about keeping the bird as a pet quickly vanished forever. Okay? The air was filled with wings and feathers and screaming. In the excitement, Walter held his legs tighter. And in, in his panic, Walter Elias, still holding on to the owl, threw it to the ground and stomped it to death. After things calmed down, Walter looked at the now dead and bloody bird and began to cry. He ran back to the farm, obtained a shovel, and buried the owl in the orchard. At night, he said he would dream of the owl. As the years passed, he never got over what happened on that, on that summer day. Deep down, it affected him for the rest of his life. As an older man, he said he never, ever killed anything again. And I would ask the question, do you see it? Something significant happened after that event. Something that Walter didn't miss. Something which transformed Walter Elias. Something that redeemed him from the, the pit of despair and disaster. Something that resurrected him. Something that made Walter, Walt, Elias, Disney give life to thousands of animals on the big screen. Christ's resurrection changes everything. It transforms us. It moves us from despair to new possibilities of life. It takes us in our blindness and it opens our eyes. It transforms ordinary bread into a holy meal. It takes two sad and lost brothers on the road to Emmaus who have lost the one thing in the world that they, that they knew and gives it back to them. Jesus came to them and, and he says, See, I am not dead. I am alive. Now go 
tell the world. So the road to Emmaus. Don't miss the significance of the resurrection because it will transform you. Today as we travel home from this place, make that road home a Emmaus Road. Don't miss the significance of the resurrection. We can be transformed if we will only take, we will only let our eyes be open. When our eyes open, we can understand that the world that wants us to conform to their ethics and their morals isn't the world that the risen Lord wants us to see. These scales can drop from our eyes and we can understand the resurrection for our own lives. Secondly, we can be convicted. Look at verse 32 if you have your, your Bible open. Verse 32, chapter 24 of Luke. When the brothers realized that the risen Lord was with them and as Jesus had vanished, they turned to each other and they say this, we find this in the scriptures, were, were not our, our hearts burning within us? Well, he was talking to us on the road while he was opening the scriptures to us? Isn't that true of our lives? We usually don't understand what's happening and, until it's over. And then we get changed. Then we look back and we, and we see the conviction within our heart. The conviction for you might be giving up pornography or, or drinking or, or gossiping. The conviction of the cross might lead you to, to look at the scriptures of God as the scriptures as God himself breathed into his prophets. After breathing them, he came in the form of a man through Jesus to, let, to tell us that all he wrote in the scriptures he means for us to know and to do. One of the greatest voices of the church was St. Augustine. He lived uh, bridging the 4th and the 5th centuries in Rome, and he was a bishop of Rome. After Rome fell and faded into dust, it, largely, it, it was largely Augustine's writings, Tertullian writings, and Origen's writings that kept Christianity alive and made it the most influential movement the world has ever known. It was remarkable that between the 8th and the 12th centuries, Augustine's writing was the most widely read, read more than any other writings. And that was four to seven hundred years after his death. But Augustine was not always a saint. Before he, before he was convicted to the Lord at age 29, he lived a to fulfill every lust and every pleasure known to man. But Augustine had one great quality that saved his pitiful life. He had a praying mother. Yes, a praying mother. Mothers have saved so many of us. I thought I'd hear from the men. Amen. She never gave up. Until one day he stopped long enough to listen to the voices around him. Augustine had just heard a sermon by St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan. We are told in public speaking and in our preaching courses not to read long quotes, but I'm going to do that anyway. And I'm going to read something that Augustine wrote. These two paragraphs shaped the hearts and minds of thousands of and thousands and maybe even millions throughout history. St. Augustine is, is looking back on his conversion and the, and the convictions of his heart. Here's the quote. One day under deep conviction I cast myself down I know not how under a certain fig tree giving full vent to my tears and the floods of mine eyes gushed out. So was I weeping in the most bitter contrition of my heart when lo! I heard from a neighboring house a voice, as a boy or a girl, I know not, chanting and oft repeating, take up and read, take up and read. Instantly my countenance altered. I began to think 
most intently whether children were, were wont in any kind of play to sing such words, nor could I remember even to have heard the like. So checking the torrent of my tears, I arose, interpreting it to be no other than the command from God to open the book and read the first chapter I should, I should find. Eagerly then I returned to the place where Elpheus, his friend, was sitting, for there I had laid the volume of the Apostles. I seized, opened, and in silence read that section on which my eyes first fell, quote, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. No further would I read, nor indeed, nor needed I for instantly at the end of this sentence, by a light, as it were, of, of serenity infused into my heart, all the darkness of doubt vanished away, and I was convicted. Convictions don't always lead to conversion. But transformation cannot happen unless we're first convicted. We may not recognize the conviction at first, but on the road to Emmaus, don't miss the significance of the resurrection. It convicts them and it convicts us. And that conviction can change us and it can change the world around us. So, on our personal road to Emmaus, don't miss the significance of the resurrection because it transforms us. Secondly, we can be convicted if we really want to be. And finally, don't miss the significance of the resurrection. It can make us witnesses. And this is perhaps the area where most of us fail. You're not, certainly not alone. If you have never spoken to another person about the death, death and resurrection of Jesus our Savior, you are in the majority. As, a, as an, uh, an opposite example of that, very few people lived the life of Billy Graham. I recently read on the Billy Graham website that Graham had preached the gospel to more people in live audiences than anyone else in history. Over 210 million people in more than 185 countries and territories. But you can measure the numbers, but you cannot measure the effect upon the world when one man reaches millions. Try to calculate the homes kept intact because of him. The marriage is saved. The children given a spiritually mature father young youth and young adults saved from drugs and thousands of other influences that Graham had. You cannot measure the effect. The significance of, of that one life cannot be calculated. Even more importantly, there is no lab or library that can account for the impact that the resurrection has had upon history. If you take the resurrection or the Gospels, the house of cards of Christianity will fall to the ground. Paul recognizes that when he writes to the church at Corinth, to the Corinthians. Some were saying that the resurrection had never happened. Paul made it clear. He said, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is in vain and the gospel is nothing but a charade. Trinity United Methodist Church, let me proclaim to you this day, that Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Amen. At the end of the Emmaus account, the two brothers do what is only natural. They get up, they walk back to Jerusalem, and they tell the other disciples whom, whom they, what they had seen. There be a witness. You can do the same thing. Telling your friends what you have seen what you have felt, and what is real in your life and, and in this world because of the resurrected Christ. 
you do not have to be a Billy Graham. You simply need to tell others what resurrection means and has meant to you. The res resurrection is significant enough to do the, the rest of the work for you. It's not your job to transform somebody, it's simply to tell others why you've been transformed and then God does the rest. It, it was the power behind the witness of the disciples. It was the power behind those two brothers on the road to Emmaus. It was the power of Paul who brought the gospel to Rome. It was the power of Augustine and Billy Graham and John Wesley and, and countless others. And it is the power behind your witness as well. On the road home today, don't miss the power of the resurrection to convict and to transform and to make you his witnesses. Allow the resurrected Jesus to change your life in ways that you can't even imagine. Go, brothers and sisters. Go and be a witness. Please pray with me. Lord, help us to open our our mouths and open our hearts to those that are most dear to us that don't believe or have fallen away or have never heard. We might watch them be transformed by your power because of a word or two that we spoke to them. In the name of Jesus. on the internet or for those of you listening on the radio, uh, I would encourage you to send in your donations to, the, to us for the work at Trinity. Let's stand and give thanks for what God has given us. Will you travel your road to a mass?